wanted to do a series of these. Uh, thanks to everyone who showed up to our, our first general, um, you know, all ages, all, all grades uh, webinar, which will also be linked in the recording if you wanted to check that out. Um, but then we thought about the fact that there are special circumstances and challenges in different grades, especially, I think, in the pre-K to two years, because A, they're not really reading um, and they're not really writing. And if they are, it's of various levels. So you've got some kids who really are struggling. And so things like chat or things like having them write things with the keyboard, that's a big transition from what they've been doing in the past. And the other thing that is a unique challenge, especially at this age range, is the attention span length. Um, you've got kids that probably seven to 10 minutes um, is a successful amount of time uh, to get them focused on something. And it's extra hard to do when they have to be sitting in a chair, looking into a screen. Um, so that's a couple of the things we wanted to address with you. Um, there are some technical things. Uh, obviously, right now, everybody is muted except for me, which I always recommend uh, at the beginning of any kind of session to cut down on the side talking and just the noise. Even if there's not talking, they might have a dog or a smaller uh, sibling or someone's doing the dishes in the room. So I always try to start with everyone on mute, um, which if you are the host, you can do that in the participants. You can select mute all, and then you can at, unmute as you ask questions. Um, and if you want um, more information on that, that's all covered in that first uh, recording, which I will send a link to, and it'll be linked to on this. Um, I'll actually put it back in the chat. I had it in the chat earlier, but I will, replicate it for anyone who came in. So that is the link to our last video. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw it over to Brian. I'll mute myself. Great, thank you. So, so I'm curious, so we've got uh, Valerie and Carol that are here. I don't know, maybe I'm not supposed to say their names if it's being recorded. So if you could just pop into the chat what grade you're in, um, I would appreciate that, just so I know who you are. Okay, outreach for all grades, trying to expand to younger grades. And first grade. So out, by doing outreach to all grades, does that um, mean that you're and doing uh, you're in the in the classroom on a daily basis working with uh, different grades as a, as an elementary science specialist or that you're not in the school right now ah okay informal education well that's a really important thing and so a lot of times you know how you work with students and so one of the things that kind of interesting with, especially if you're working with, with uh, kids in no matter what uh, situation that you're in. Um, I always kind of like to do a little engagement piece right off the bat. And so usually if you're working with the kids, you want to, you know, give them, you know, we're thinking about shadows today. And so you might want to take them outside and get them engaging them in some of their experiences of it. And so yesterday, I was out having a going on a little walk. And so I looked down and I noticed my shadow and I was thinking about shadows anyway, because I knew that we were gonna be thinking about shadows today. And so I thought about my shadow and I noticed a couple of interesting things about my shadow. And so let me just kind of play this and see if we notice anything about my shadow. And this might be, and so what you could do is, and, and I'm kind of thinking, in terms of how I would approach this with, with the young learners. And you want them to think about their experience with their own shadows as well. So let's kind of watch this and see if we notice anything about the shadow. 
and it should be plain, but it's not. Huh, how very odd. Or if there's something that I didn't do. Bear with me for a minute here. So Ava, if you want to just Andy, chat with them you, a minute while uh, I figure this out. Want to write your grade on in the chat. This, we're just asking people as they come in to write their grade or what age kids they work with. Okay. Let me back out of that and restart. Kindergarten, great. We have a first grade teacher, a kindergarten teacher, and a museum teacher that is here. And we have other people who are coming in slowly. I know you've had a long day of uh, educating our kids from home and, and we appreciate all the work that you do. So. And 3 p.m. kind of feels like 6 p.m. nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll give okay. it another shot. Let's see if it works this time. There we go. Is it moving? Yes. So I was out walking and I noticed my shadow and then, you know, I keep walking here. And so, you know, there's things that I noticed and maybe the learners in your class might notice too. And I also noticed that some of the other things around, you know, whether or not there's any other shadows in the area. So as we're kind of going, we're a small enough group and, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and to just kind of tell us what you're noticing about the shadow. Now kind of watch what happens here. Oh my gosh. That's an interesting thing that just happened. So what just happened? Shadows bend. Your shadow and the lamppost shadow interacted. The shadow could go from the front to behind. Okay, so what do you think? And, and so what was something that we noticed about what my shadow was doing? And I'm going to leave it up here for just a, a moment. So just go ahead and, and you know, mention what, what did you happen to notice about what my shadow did? It was on the ground and then it was on the wall. Okay. So when I was walking down originally, it was off to my left. And then all of a sudden, where was my shadow? It moved, it twisted. And then it was off to my right. And so why would your shadow go from one side to the other? What are some things that would cause your shadow to switch directions from being on my left to being on my right? What do you think? What could make my shadow move? What side of you the sun is on? Okay. So I guess that brings up a good question. What do you need to have even to make a shadow? The sun. The sun. A or light some some sort of a what? A light source. A light source. Some sort of a light source would be important. And then what's my body doing? So what's the, where's the shadow? So how does it get there? What's it doing to the light from the light source? Well, your body is opaque. <laughs> and the light okay. So, and, and so if we think of it in simple terms, I know some first grade uh, uh, teachers actually introduced the word opaque, um, which is kind of a, a fancy word that really just means what? <laughs> I like plain language. And so opaque is a, is a fancy word that we use that really means what? It's 
it's a solid, a solid. It's yeah. light can't go through it. Can't see through it. Yeah, and so something gets in the way and it blocks the light. And so what's a possibility for why my shadow switches sides? And so there's a couple of different things that might be possible here. The light source could have moved. Yeah, maybe the sun moved. Or, or maybe the object blocking it moved. Or if you look here, what might I have done? You might have turned your body. Yeah, I might have turned the corner and I come down this path one way and then go the other way. And then I kind of look down and look my shadow and then we've got this uh, practicing social distancing. Are shadows very good at practicing distancing? No. <laughs> oh, they're terrible at practicing distancing. Okay, so this is something, so I had an experience with a shadow. We can think about some of the questions that we might have about shadows. We can think about what we know about shadows. And so a lot of, a lot of teachers, when they introduce this, they'll do a KWL chart or a what do we know, what do we wonder about, and then later on, what did we learn about shadows after they've gone through. And so we might have been able to populate the K and the W columns in a KWL chart here at this point. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it back over to Teresa. I'll be back in just a few minutes. And she's gonna tell you a story about um, somebody who was experiencing their shadow in much the same way. So I'm gonna stop sharing and then it's I'm gonna go to Teresa. Hi, I'm Teresa and uh, I will, Brian and I have actually been working on a project uh, about storybooks and how they impact science and uh, science retention. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, we actually are doing a storybook reading uh, every Monday here at ASP. And so I wanted to read you the story that we've been working on. Can everyone see the cover of the book? You might know this book by Frank Ash. It's called Moon Bear Shadow. And he did both the words and the pictures. And you can see Moon Bear jumping over the water there and chasing a butterfly. And you can actually see his shadow right underneath him. So it's a good way to start our book. One day, Bear went down to the pond with his fishing pole and a big can of worms. When he was putting his worm on a hook, he looked down and saw a big fish. I'm gonna catch that fish, thought Bear to himself. There he's seeing the fish. Do you see the fish in the water? Well, when Bear stood up to throw his line in the water and catch that fish, his shadow scared the big fish away. Go away, shadow, cried Bear. But Bear's shadow would not go away. Okay, said Bear, if you won't go away on your own, then I'll just have to get rid of you. And he put down his fishing pole and he began to run. He ran around the pond, and when he got to the other side, he kept on running. He ran through a field of flowers, jumped over a brook, and hid behind a tree. Good, thought Bear. Now Shadow can't find me. Where do you think Bear Shadow is now? If you have someone with you and you want to say a, a word to them about what you think is going on, you can do that. But Bear was wrong. When he stepped out from behind the tree, the first thing that he saw was Shadow. Nearby was the cliffs. Bear walked over to the cliff and looked up. I'll climb up so high that Shadow won't be able to follow me, thought Bear. Bear climbed higher and higher until he, at last he pulled himself up to the top. Huffing and puffing, he smiled with pride. And then he looked down 
and saw a shadow. Now Bear was very annoyed, so he went home and got a hammer and some nails to nail his shadow down to the ground. He hammered and hammered and hammered, but no matter how many nails he hammered, he couldn't nail down his shadow. Isn't that a silly idea, trying to nail down his shadow? If I can't nail him down, thought Bear, maybe I can bury him. So he got his shovel and dug a hole, and when the hole was deep and wide, he let his shadow fall into the hole. Then Bear filled the hole with dirt. When he was finished, it was almost noon. The sun was high in the sky, and shadow was nowhere to be seen. At last, cried Bear, no more shadow. And look, the sun is up high in the sky, and so it's around noontime, and noontime shadows get very, very short. But now Bear was very tired, so he went inside and took a little nap. While he slept, time passed, and the sun once again cast shadows everywhere. You can see the shovel that he left outside is actually getting a longer and longer shadow. When Bear got up and opened his door, he saw the shadow on the floor. Not you again, he shouted. And he slammed the door, hoping to lock Shadow inside. But Shadow was too quick. There he sees him on the, on the doorway there. Oh, sighed Bear. How about this? If you let me catch a fish, I'll let you catch one too. Nod your head like this if it's a deal. And where Bear nodded his head, Shadow nodded too. So Bear went back to the pond and once again threw his line in the water. By this time, the sun was in a different part of the sky, which made it easy for Shadow to keep his part of the deal. And there's Bear's shadow behind him, so it's not falling into the water and scaring the fish anymore. And when Bear caught that big fish, Shadow caught one too. And they learned to work together. And so uh, a really wonderful story about shadows. And um, we are re doing this reading series at ASP, like I said, called Astronomy at Home. And you're welcome to join us Monday at 11 um, or have your kids join us and share that resource. But we really wanted to talk about how you can read a story and then have some interactive activities that go with it. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Brian and he's gonna share a couple of activities. Okay, thank you, Teresa. So we, uh, as Teresa mentioned, we've been doing some work with some first grade teachers about integrating some activities with the storybook in their classrooms. And so what I wanna do is I want to, again, you know, go back to the video we're gonna make believe that it's going to work first time this and show you a couple of images of uh, this in action and so here's kind of the tail end of uh, uh, my explorations yesterday my shadow's not particularly sharp like it was and so i thought that this would be kind of an interesting thing you know my shadow's a little fainter so why would my shadow be a little bit fainter what might be happening that might make my shadow fainter So it's a phenomenon my... we often have happen in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> a little it bit is. of fog rolling in. <laughs> <laughs> so that's something, you know, you, uh, you certainly, um, we know that shadows, we have a light source, we have an object that blocks the light, which is our body. Um, but does the light always reach our body to make a shadow? So maybe something else is blocking the light. So what are some other things that can block the light from getting to us? Clouds, buildings, trees. Yeah, lots of things. Taller people. <laughs> Taller people. I like that. So let me um, press play here. Oh. 
So here's a little activity and I'll show you what these look like in just a minute. Um, but we had these students, they had these gnomes that they had, and they have these patterned papers, which they try to make using a flashlight, and they try to match up the shadow pattern on the paper um, with um, the actual shadow that the gnome casts with their flashlight. And so that's kind of a fun thing that they were, were doing. They've almost got it there. They're having way too, they had way too much fun with the light, you know, blind the cameraman. And so then another thing is that they would take their gnomes outside on a blank piece of paper and they would trace the shadow that the gnome is making. And then they would come back later on in the day and they would trace the next shadow. And then later on in the day, they'd come back and trace the shadow again. And so here's what the gnomes look like. Here's what these look like. And I'll show you where you can get those. Here's a link, which hopefully the play bar isn't in the way. I bet it is though. Well, we'll, we'll dredge that up and give you the, the link to this here in just um, a few minutes. And so this is kind of a, a fun way to do that. One of the things that we notice is that the students, when they would take their, um, their papers out, to trace their gnome shadow later on in the day, they discovered that you know, they wouldn't always orient them correctly. And so their shadow would end up being the opposite direction from where it, it should be. So one of the other activities that they also did was uh, they had these challenge cards and we'll give you the link to that. And so the, I'll show you what these challenge cards look like. And they're based on, and they actually use some of the imagery from the book. And then there we've got uh, Moonbear. Part of what we did with this project is that we actually also went to the planetarium uh, at the Lawrence Hall of Science. And we ended up doing a, these are tracings of Moonbear's shadow or the bear's shadow at the different times. So that was kind of a fun thing that we had a chance to work with the with the teachers on. But these activities that we have, and so here I switched cameras, and so here's one of these activities, and you can get these challenge cards, and we'll either Teresa or um, Ava will put the link up uh, to this. It's on our website, and anyone can download these. And so here's some imagery about uh, with some challenges that the students can do. And so this one is, bear wants to hide in the sh shade of a tree. Can you help him? And so what they do is here we've got a tree, we've got a little bear, we've got a pond with a fish, and we have a sun. And so here we've got, if you've got a tree, the tree, and it's really hard to see this, but there we've got a shadow. We can see where the sun is. And so where would you put bear to be in the shadow of the tree? So you could put bear there. If you wanted to make it so that bear's shadow touched the fish, and so how do you orient, you know, where would the light have to be? And so there we can see that bear shadow is touching the fish. But if the sun was over here, then bear shadow wouldn't be touching the fish. And so this is something what they can do is they can really explore what happens to the shadows, both the direction that it's going and the length of shadows, depending on where the sun happens to be. And so this is one of the things that you, we, we did with the, with the gnomes is when we took those out with the blank piece of paper like this. And so it's hopefully gonna, so there you can see a, a shadow. And so they notice that during the course of a day that the length and the direction change and there's a pattern to it. And so that this is something where the students can learn about the pattern and how the, what their shadow is like is different at different times of the day. And then they can, one of the other exercises that's related to that too, and this is hard to see because it's real shiny, but you can see that here's these different shadow patterns. And so you can ask them to try to match up 
the gnome shadow with these shadow patterns. And so here we've got, you know, there I've got this pattern right here. Uh, it matched up pretty well. If I want this over here, what do I have to do to, to the sun? What do I have to do to the sun to make it match up with this one instead of this one? Sun's got to be in a different spot in the sky. Yeah, and so then they learn that they have to move the, sh the sun over here. And so it had to cross the sky to get there. So I think that um, we asked everyone to bring a flashlight and some sort of a figure. Did everyone have uh, figures and, and whatnot? And so I'm going to give you a challenge. And so if you didn't bring a flashlight by any chance, you can use the, your phone. Most yeah, people phones have a flashlight great. on your phone. So here's, here's a challenge. And so try to make bear shadow in front of him. See if you can get bear shadow to be in front of him. So that's an exploration. And this is something that you could do online with your students and have them do, you know, I, I've done much more explanation of, you know, what the materials are, are like rather than having you do these activities. Um, and so certainly you would be able to just have the students if they have a little figure, you know, it could be a, a bear, you know, these are just counting bears. And a lot of, a lot of teachers have counting bears. Um, I know that uh, many districts gave out packets of materials to families to use at home. And unfortunately, the teachers weren't able to intercept those before the districts decided to send them out. Um, but if you could, you know, putting things like, a, you know, a couple of counting bears probably would have been a, a good thing in each of the packets. So if you can try to make the shadow in front of him and then try to make the shadow behind him. And so there are some different things that you can do with seeing if you can make the shadow be in different places. Then there's a little extension, an extra little challenge on the back. And so what, when do you see your own shadow? And so these are more kind of more general type questions to get them really pondering about the phenomenon that they've experienced. And so here you can make a phenomenon of the shadow in front, the shadow behind, but then to ponder the phenomenon just a little bit more, when do you see your own shadow? Do you see your shadow on a cloudy day? And so this is kind of a, an extra reflection type piece that um, even, even small children, even young children, are able to accomplish fairly well. All right. So any questions about that or any comments from uh, anyone? I just want to say something also, oh, which is that um, using these tools that um, kids have at home, like flashlights, and it might not be a bear, but you know, most kids have something like this or a doll at home that they can use but and you you might not feel like you're doing real science if you're using these toys but um, lots of studies have shown that um, from the exploratorium and other things that using uh, materials that kids normally use will uh, increase their engagement with science about the time that they spend, uh, the quality of the questions and things that they retain after their experience with the materials. So um, I just want to encourage you to think about things that you have in your house that probably other people have in their house. And not every student even has a house. So I don't want to be uh, making things to light of things, but um, most kids have a pair of scissors or a pen or crayons. And so those things can, can really make a, a big difference. And that's why I really like these gnomes is that you can, you know, if you have a, a, some online resources where you're able to give some documents to your parents to print out for their children, then, you know, it wouldn't be that hard of a thing to send them a page of gnomes, um, some of the 
challenge cards to be able to see whether or not they can match up the shadows. It's really easy to send them a set of these. There, it's a PDF set, and so we'll get you the, uh, um, it looks like uh, Teresa put the link up to, to this in the chat. And so you can get to where these are, a full description of the activity and a PDF of these challenge cards are there. So and what feel free really to take those and distribute those to um, the families that you're working with. And what I wanted to mention, um, just so uh, you have a little bit more insight on where this activity came from, is that uh, at the ASP, we, we were challenged to create um, astronomy materials for three to five-year-olds. And people said, well, that can't be done. Kids that young don't understand astro astronomy. That's not a thing that's in their, their worldview. <laughs> but it actually is a majority of what they understand because they are very curious about the sun and the moon. And things like shadows are astronomical phenomenon and people don't really think about it that way. Um, and so we had the challenge of creating activities. Um, and in the link that I put up, there's there's other ones on there if you're interested, um, especially, you know, Mandy, you've got five-year-olds probably that um, you're working with. And a lot of these things go right in to six, seven, eight. Um, there's some stuff that you can kind of take the building blocks of these kind of higher level sciences and spark that interest um, in a very young age and get them feeling like they are scientists. And we do like at the ASP to point out to kids that they are science scientists because they are doing science, because they are observing and they're thinking about their observation. And uh, this is a, my segue to talking about breakout rooms. Um, Can which, I, I I'm uh, sorry. just mention that um, in the chat, uh, Brian put in the link to the activity, the gnome activity that he was showing earlier. Okay. Um, and so uh, my segue to the breakout rooms is when we were trying to brainstorm what we were talking, going to talk about in this particular um, grade uh, bracket, we were thinking of how are we going to tie this all together and we chose shadows. Um, and we picked different ways to kind of um, solidify a concept for kids by teaching it from different angles. Um, a lot of kids learn better through reading, a lot of kids learn better through listening or maybe through using their hands and a tactile experience. So giving them the opportunity to learn a concept um, through various ways, um, you'll kind of catch more of them. You'll get more of them to understand um, and engage in ways that work for them. Um, so we're trying to think of the tools that you guys have available to you in this sort of new way of trying to teach things. And so one of the tools is the breakout rooms. And the breakout rooms um, can be used in mul multiple ways. Um, we typically with adults use them for small group discussion. There'll be a, a lecture and then we have some questions and we get people talking about those and maybe you know brainstorming an idea. And that can be applied to this age group. Um, again, we were talking about the chat and how some of these kids aren't really writing or reading on any kind of level where that's a good tool for them. But a breakout room might be a good way of doing it. And what I'll do is I'm going to do a really quick screen share um, about the breakout rooms. Uh, and just, and I, I also will share this, but... Um, Zoom actually has on their site this little video, which will explain it in much more in depth. Um, and it talks about whether you're using it for large groups and the limitations of the breakout room, whether uh, you're going to assign people ahead of time, or if you're going to figure it out right before you do it. Um, cause you, you're going to have different scenarios and you might want to use this. Um, you might want to figure out 
which kids you specifically want talking to each other because they all have different personalities and some kids are more shy and less likely to speak up if they're in a room where there's kids that really want to talk over other kids and, and be, you know, sharing. So that might be something you want to plan ahead and then you can assign those, um, those rooms to the kids as you pre-plan your lesson. Or it might be something where you do it on the fly because you've just been discussing with them and you see that there's a certain group that are interested in one specific part of what you're talking about and another group that votes to be put in a different room because they're interested in a different aspect. And that way you're using your time with them wisely. So I'm going to do a little breakout room um, and there's not many of us, but I will just um, assign and the, if you are the main host, so most of the teachers, you are the main host of your classrooms, but you might have a para or you might have a parent helper, or you might have a teacher that you're doing something with. You have to have the person who has, who is the main host, not co-host, um, will have breakout room privilege at the bottom of the screen. And again, all of this, it, there's detail in that thing I just screen shared. So I'll post that in the chat. Um, and then, so I will just randomly, it says you could either do it automatically or manually. I'm going to put it on automatically. So it'll randomly put us in some rooms and then, um, we can talk about the concept of shadows and other ways that we would maybe teach about the concept of shadows to our kids. So um, on the count of three, we will go into a breakout room. And you've been joined, asked, invited to join a room. So you can accept the invitation. They might have been having a good conversation that they didn't want to stop. You're muted, Ava. How was the, your chat over in the other room? It was great. We talked to, um, if I am not sharing confidences, one of the museum educators, Valerie, um, mentioned that she uses, she uses this activity in her museum and uh, some of the older siblings and younger siblings have really um, fun interactions that, that they use. That's very cool. Um, and Virginia, I wanted to uh, welcome you and I I've, I've apologize that um, I don't know how long you were in the waiting room. I noticed you when I went to go set up uh, the breakout rooms and I did not see you uh, in the waiting room ahead of time. So I really hope you weren't waiting in there too, too long. <laughs> All right, so that was um, just kind of a little bit of a demonstration on how the breakout rooms work. Again, it's, it's not perfectly um, streamlined. A lot of times there's a little bit of technical glitching on getting people back. It might not take, um, you know, exactly the same amount of time for everyone's screen to pop back over. Um, but it is a really great tool. Um, and, and I had planned on doing it, but I just came, brought everyone back to in, in, in the interest of, of time of, to pop over to um, the other group, which as the main host you can do. Um, and that way, if you've got your kids broken up into groups of five or six and they're all talking, you can just kind of go in and check and make sure they're not talking about Minecraft, that they are in fact still talking about the subject that you had kind of given them. Um, and then you can all come back to the main group and they can share what they've 
they've talked about in their smaller groups. And it sort of breaks up that attention span that we were talking about earlier, where if they're all in the big group, after about seven or eight minutes, maybe you put them in the small group and it sort of resets. It lets them redirect and get re-energized. Um, and then when they come back again, they've got a new activity going. So um, that's, a, that's a nice one to kind of have in your back pocket um, if you're all 23 of you are all sitting there in the chair, give them a moment to kind of stretch in between. Um, so the other little thing about the breakout rooms I wanted to mention is uh, that you can't record all of them. So I know for the recording, it's different depending on your district. You may have different rules or different guidelines on how you're doing that and what you're using them with. But um, some of you might be recording for your own purposes to review um, and maybe not sharing, but just to have to kind of see. And uh, if you do use the breakout rooms, it will only record what you're seeing. So if you have four other rooms, what's happening as you're not in them just kind of flies off to the ether. <laughs> um, so that's, that's one thing that I wanted to make you aware of. Um, I don't think you get a text file of it either. But again, all that stuff, I will put this in the chat because I don't think I have yet. Um, is all outlined on the Zoom link. Yeah. So they go into better detail describing all the limitations and features of the breakout rooms. And if you're going to break up into a lot of different rooms, you can give them some very specific directions and that helps them follow through. Like say, we're going to take two minutes and we're going to find out everybody's favorite color in this group and then tell me which is the most and the least favorite color um, when we get back. So really short things if you're telling them, it, it helps them um, stay focused if you're not gonna be able to visit all of the breakout rooms. And Mrs. Siddle, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, um, could you talk a little bit about how you've been using breakout rooms in your class? Um, I have, uh, actually, I have a teacher's aide that's coming into the room now, and I have a, a student that uh, needs special help, one of my full inclusion kids. Um, part of my challenge was to have him understand how to, when he needed to go out. So what I did is, uh, the other day I met with him, I had him come in about 10 minutes earlier, and I wasn't sure if it would be uppercase letters or lowercase letters that I would join, J-O-I-N. So later on, when you see that word, and then I held up one that was lowercase, just not sure which way he would be invited. So it, just to like train him of when to go out was a little bit of a challenge, but he got it today, you know, he figured it out. Once he knew it, he could do it successfully today and get out quicker. So for certain kids, you might want to give them clues of how to join, <laughs> how to go to their breakout room. So uh, that way the, uh, he's able to work one-on-one -on -one for a little bit of time and with his read and with the paraprofessional. So that's how I tried it so far. It was a little bit, for me, it was at first, ah, what am I doing? But I, you know, I understand it a lot better now. So that I, the, for the amount of time, you could click that in. And I realized if I wanted the kids, like another kid to go back to back, it's like, oh no, I have to put more than 20 minutes. I have to make room for the other kids when they go. So it's all a learning curve for me. Okay, and I think, um, Brian, you had a couple more things. Yeah, one of the things that I think it's, it's, it's a challenge translating activities like this into this virtual environment. And in a normal classroom setting, you might go and you might take a half hour 
for 40 minutes or something to engage in some of these activities. You might read the book and then have them work with the gnomes. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically about the things that we we're sharing here. But especially with this age group, a lot of times they don't have that attention span to be actively engaged. And so a lot of times giving them some task that they can work on and then come back the next time you see them and they can kind of talk about their experience with it. The other thing that um, you know, I, I kind of we're, we're getting really, really close to the top of the hour here. And so I, I would have been interested to have uh, learned what your ideas about maybe extension type activities. And so one of the things, because with this age group, literacy is so important and writing is certainly a part of that, that we've read a book, we've done some activities having to do with that book and giving the students an opportunity to come up with their own story or their own narrative that incorporates some of these same themes and the phenomenon into their experience that they're relating something and maybe even doing a little bit of art or doing some art and really making it kind of a, a whole steam type activity for them rather than just this narrow little um, science uh, activity that they've done. So, so much to, uh, so many possibilities here. Yes, um, and we also really wanted you guys to have a chance to ask questions or talk about strategies that are challenging or working for you um, because you guys have so much great experience in the classroom and, and uh, changing to online is definitely shifting gears as we say. Um, does anybody have anything either they would like to put in the chat or to um, unmute themselves? And to either share a success story or something that's challenging you in this switch to online learning. Well, with our younger kids coming into Zoom, um, I've been lucky enough that I have a, par a parent that can answer questions. So a, a lot of the parents, I mean, not a lot, but some of the parents already are experienced with it. So whenever I have, have had problems, I just ask. I go, hello, parents, does someone know? <laughs> I'm not afraid to ask. For me, Always I good getting have... the parents on your side. Go ahead, Mandy, sorry. For me, I only have 19 students and I, have only had about six um, show up for Zoom and only about five or six watching the videos that our school has chose to just do YouTube videos and post those for the students to go and watch anytime. And so I've only had like six even show up and we live in a really low income area and the school has been supplying for the older students hotspots and laptops and stuff. So I think I have a lot of that going on in my class. So we're doing the best we can with what we have. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the nice things about having multiple approaches because Zoom might just be one of the components. You have a, you're teaching a certain topic or you're a concept and some of it's going to be printouts. Well, not everyone's going to have a printer at home and some people are not going to be able to come to a video, but maybe they got the stuff that got mailed to them in their packet. So you just kind of have to cast that big net and hope that it hits some of the kids um, one way and maybe others another. Um, and then, you know, I feel like recording things or trying to figure out ways that you've got the stuff that comes on through the video, um, putting it out there in a different way um, is probably gonna help with, cause that's, that's going to be a problem everywhere is the kids who just don't have access to the video technology because they, they're, like you said, they've got to go to a hot spot or they've got one computer in the house and the parents using it. Or brother and sister or multiple brothers and sisters. And so, and they're all having class at the same time and, you know, it just doesn't work. <laughs> and also if you can record it, your, your um, things that you really want the kids to learn, um, even if it's just a short two minute recording then they could watch it at their own time maybe that's after their mom or dad gets done with work or after um, their siblings finish their high school lessons then maybe they'll be able to 
watch your video that you make. So another, another thing that a, a different teacher from our first um, webinar that we did like this mentioned is that he made a spreadsheet where he contacted the parents and he wrote down, he asked them, what do you have access to? Do you, or is your kid going to be on an iPad? It, are they, do they have a printer at home? Do, and he said that he kind of figured out different solutions for the different types of parents. So there's some parents that might maybe, um, he's texting them a video of, you know, like here's the five kids that I text the little three minute clip that's like the distilled lesson. And that way they're still getting something and the parents text them back, yeah, I got it, I showed it to him. Or the parents taking a photo of the homework and texting the teacher back. So you make either your phone number or your email or that's the point of contact, not Zoom. Um, so there's a lot of different strategies. And again, I will link um, that video um, in the comments on this one when I post it on YouTube and I'll email you guys the link to this once we've got it recorded and up. And cut yourself some slack. It's a global pandemic and you're gonna have some kids who are have way more stressors than they normally do and might not be able to connect with what you're doing. Um, but keep keep your chin up. <laughs> uh, and on a personal level, I will say that because my my daughter is in Mrs. Siddle's class, and I think that it gives her um, a sense of normalcy and a sense of continuation from what was happening before, and warmth and love and community. So even if the stuff you want to teach doesn't all come through, that part definitely is. And a lot of these kids really need that extra support emotionally right now, and you guys are all doing that as well. Oh yeah, it's definitely been a change for everyone. My kids are nine, seven, and five. So <laughs> I've got all that going on with uh, teaching my students. So keep them busy. And my husband's the technology director for the school district. So he's the one that's in charge of the school website, all the laptops, hotspots. So we've been busy around here. Good luck, man. <laughs> Homeschooling probably, and working is so challenging and having everybody doing yeah, it. He probably has a 24 hour a day job right now. And of course, you know, if any, if anything's not working, he's the one who hears the complaints. <laughs> well, thank you so very much. We want to be respectful of your time and it, it is the top of the hour. So um, we really appreciate you coming. Um, Again, this video is going to be available. I'm not making these public. I'm making these URL share only. So if you have other teachers that you want to share this with, we're not making it just wild, widely available on the internet. You have to have the URL. So go ahead and share it with those people. And that way you can also review 